So here we are. I'm recording. And now it's Q&A. So if you have the Qs, I have the As. What you got? Any questions about this Amazon stuff? I will point out one thing. I'll, I'll mention consistency. Okay. Yeah, consistency is a weird thing. We'll, we'll get to that uh, shortly. One thing. Later today, I will post some examples of exam preparation that successful students have done in the past. Right? But basically, it involves fairly detailed notes. Okay, Going through the lectures, uh, writing down key points, and linking those key points to others. All right. So for example, the one of the standard things I give, uh, if you understand what database acid properties are, it's easier to understand things like eventual consistency or why two-phase commit is necessary. Okay, so all this stuff builds on itself. Um, anyway, that, that's the key thing. But I'll post some things up in the extras folder on the lecture sections after this. Okay, so I saw we had uh, some questions here. Consistency. Uh, yes, all of the past recordings are available on YouTube. That is correct. Consistency is a strange and difficult thing. It means that any database operation will take the database from one consistent state to another consistent state. Okay. What does that mean? What is a consistent state? Well, consistent state means that the database follows its own rules. So, for example, uh, the example I gave uh, for Facebook back in the day, right? If someone is your friend on Facebook, then they can see, you know, let's say, Posts, right? Most posts from you. But if someone is not your friend on Facebook, then they can't. So you wouldn't want to make some kind of change in the database where, for example, a person could be simultaneously a friend and not a friend. That's an example. Okay. So a simple violation of consistency would be some replicas show a user as a friend, others show the user as not a friend, okay? This could happen if the information is stored at different data centers, for example. So if your friend, if your non-friend, whatever, uh, was connected through uh, data center one, he'd be your friend, right? But if he connected through DC2, he wouldn't be. Okay. There are many ways, many ways that a uh, that consistency can be broken. Okay, so I'll box this up. One possibility out of many. Okay. There are many different ways where consistency can be broken, but this is what it means: is that if your database 
was entirely consistent before an operation happened, right? then it should be consistent after any allowed operation. If your database was consistent before an allowed operation, it must be consistent afterward. Okay. And I, will, I guess I'll, I'll add this. Uh, Non-isolation is a major contributing factor to consistency breakdowns. Okay, so I hope that helps. Let's see. Other stuff. Oh, uh, okay. Client-server architecture rules and tiers. Okay, we'll we'll do these in order. In client-server architecture, the tiers are really easy, right? So you have a server, not even really a tier, right? Just a server machine that serves some group of clients, okay? And your client tier is basically all the users. So down here, clients that use that server. Again, the key point is the server needs to have all the data and applications needed by the various clients, okay? Which tends to severely scale, okay? Once you start branching out and doing uh, ender architecture, right? Then you might, I'll just draw a quick thing here. You might have a server in the middle that can connect to one of various data machine storage machines in the back. Okay. Basically, end tier is going to look something like this. You have your application server middle to do the work. Your clients are still interact with this one. And the application can database machine okay your application server can connect to any of these database machines but in true end tier architecture then you also have multiple application servers as well and when necessary they can connect you know to any of these databases as well and I, I guess i will draw all the lines i wasn't planning, but sure i'll draw them all so can you give an example of these type of servers can i what Give an example of this kind of server. Oh, like Facebook. Okay, when you go to Facebook, you don't pick what server you're going to, right? Facebook automatically picks one for you, right? So that's that's essentially what it is. You go to Facebook, you log in at facebook.com. Behind the scenes, behind that interface, Facebook connects you to a server where the applications are running, and then those applications, wherever they're needed, they can connect to whatever database machines your data is actually stored on. Okay. The oh, big okay. Yeah, the big companies like Facebook and Google were the first to use this kind of structure because they had size needs that you know smaller businesses did not. Okay, so I'll write over here because this is recorded. I'll write over here, client server, and over here I'll write. And tier. Okay, so that's the basic structure. So right. are, are the tiers like uh, ba basically the end tiers of the client server architect? Uh, each tier is a group of machines doing the same kind of thing. So you have one tier that's database machines, right? And another tier that's application servers. And then client tier is all the people that are showing up to use it. A tier just means a group of machines doing the same kind of thing. So in N tier, you know, this is your standard three tier setup. Now, of course, it's gone a bit beyond this in uh, cloud systems, uh, but, you know, this is this is close enough for IDS 200. The reality is a little bit more complicated these days. All right. 
All right, let me see. I'm going to grab the next thing here. Uh, tight versus loose. Yeah. Okay. So tight versus loose coupling. Okay, so I was just thinking about this the other day for a different course, actually, and a way to explain it. So in a tightly coupled system, there are many dependencies, right? We'll talk about what that means in a minute. In a loosely coupled system, there are few or no dependencies. What does that mean? Okay, so let's suppose... <clears throat> Excuse me. Suppose I have written, I don't know, suppose I have written a oh, variation on connect four, say. Okay. I've written you guys all know connect four, right? I've written a connect four application. And I have some tests built in. to where players are clicking on the screen, okay, to, to make their moves. Could be connect four, could be chess, checkers, whatever. But I have some tests built in where the players are clicking on the screen to make moves. Now, in a tightly coupled application, these checks would involve specific pixel ranges, right? Like the rectangle, rectangle from 0, 0 to 50, 50, something like that, right? It would be one particular square of the machine of the application window where I would be checking where stuff happens for one move, okay? Something like that. In a loosely coupled application, I wouldn't check specific pixel ranges, but perhaps some fraction of the application window size, okay? And the difference with this is when I write up my code, right? So for this one, there might be a whole bunch of different places in the code. I'm gonna represent those with red lines. Different places in the code where I have to check particular pixel sizes right? Meaning if I want to change any of this, it's a big pain in the ass to change it, right? This is what we said about any kind of tightly coupled system. You can have very detailed specifications about things, but it's a real hassle to change stuff. I have to go through the entire application logic and make sure I get all these and correct them, and hopefully I didn't miss any. On the other hand, in a loosely coupled system, loosely coupled application, I basically have one method, right? I have one method that reads the application window size and perhaps references the particular pixel range from there. And everything else in the code, I'm gonna mark those down by green, everything else in the code that references those window ranges just goes to this part, right? It reads that data from that point. So if I want to change this part of the application in a loosely coupled application, I go here to this one point where those uh, window ranges are kept, right, where those pixel ranges are kept. I change that, and all these other things automatically catch up to it, okay? That's basically what it is. Now, you can come up with other ways of doing it, but the essentials, I'm going to just undo a bunch of stuff here. The essentials of it are the... A tightly coupled system can exploit unique uh, attributes of hardware and thereby get better performance, right? You're designing, you're designing the system around known hardware components, okay? But that builds in dependencies that builds in 
dependencies, which makes the system difficult to change. Because once you change the system, you add on some new or different hardware, maybe you can't do those same tricks that you used to do with your old hardware. Okay. On the other hand, a loosely coupled system has to use somewhat generic interfaces, right? It can't assume knowledge of specific hardware. So its performance won't be as good but the system will be much easier to change because you're already not assuming specific hardware. Okay, that's, that's the difference. Tightly coupled, it could perform better, but it's difficult to change. Loosely coupled, it's not gonna perform as well because it's not gonna be designed around specific components. It's gonna have to uh, make some assumptions about uh, generic, you know, uh, generic capabilities of just about any hardware, and it'll have to work with them. Okay, but that attribute makes it much easier to change. Uh, so essentially, what we're talking here in terms of software, if you like, this is like an application built for a specific uh, operating system and hardware configuration, right? Could be as advanced as the uh, components permit, right? But this, like a generic web app available to use uh, by any machine, any internet capable machine, probably won't be terribly complicated or else it might not work. Okay, but that's the difference. All right, let me uh, get another question here. Do, 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 go up tight and loose. Correlation confidence lift. Yeah. Okay. So people have trouble with these. That's okay. Uh, so correlation, right? Correlation just means whether things happen together or not. Okay. So what we... Uh, Give me a second. So for some reason, I'm I, the specific term is eluding me for a moment. I'll probably remember it as soon as I support. Yeah. Okay. So support means the probability of two items being bought together. Right, basically, is this a popular combination? All right, that's what that's what support means. Lift is the conditional probability. If a customer bought X, what's the probability that that same customer also bought some other product Y. Okay, we'll give examples for all these in a second too. And then, uh, let's not lift. Now I'm, I'm all forgetting my terms. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little, it's been a, it was a rough night. The kids are loud. That's what I'm gonna blame all this on. Jeez, confidence, yeah, okay. So confidence is the probability, conditional probability. Then lift is the excess of confidence over the, I don't know, the baseline probability of X and Y bought. Uh, 
I guess, of Y being bought by any random customer. Okay, so let's give an example around uh, McDonald's for these because everybody understands McDonald's. So, probability of two items being bought together. So, suppose, given McDonald's's large menu, suppose 10% of customers buy Big Mac and fries. Okay, probably not too far off. So, 10% of customers buy Big Mac and fries. And we might add, for a wide product line, 10% is a lot, okay? I mean, if, you're, uh, if your store sold 100,000 different items, then, you know, 10% might be insanely high. But for McDonald's, yeah, maybe 10% is the highest that they've seen. So we might ask, what's the second one? What's the conditional probability? Well, if a customer bought X, what's the probability that they also bought Y? So let's say if a customer bought a Big Mac, there's an 80% chance they also bought fries. Okay, maybe that's true. So this tells us, right, this first one, let's do a little box around that. So we can add here popular combo, good for advertising. Right, you can say this is the sort of this is the most popular combination at McDonald's. This might be something we want to include in our ads as a standard thing that a lot of people are going to be interested in. Okay, this this second one, if you know that things are often bought together, this can be good for things like streamlining uh, operations. Right, you know don't have the Big Mac maker also be the fry maker, for example, okay? And also things like uh, combo deals. If you know these are often bought together in the sense that person who buys one often buys the other one, uh, combo deals are worth looking into at least, okay? But then we get into Lyft, and Lyft is a little trickier. So Lyft says, and put that in green, I guess. Suppose 90% of McDonald's customers buy fries. Then, even though the 80% confidence sounds high, right? It's not. It's, it's really not that hot uh, because the lift is actually going to be 80% divided by 90% equals about 0 0.089. It's going to be less than one. So here, a Big Mac customer is less likely to buy fries. So this makes us see, you know what? Even though, yeah, a lot of people who buy Big Macs are buying fries, that, that's true. And even though it seems like a popular combination, we're actually finding that Big Mac customers are less likely than an average person to buy fries. So a Big Mac person is not really a good proxy for someone who's likely to buy fries. Might be that all your customers are pretty likely to buy fries, and that's fine. But, you know, Big Mac is not telling you a lot that this is a particularly strong combination in your organization. Okay, but on the other hand, if you found that uh, or if only 25% of customers bought fries, then buying a Big Mac tells you a lot, right? tells you that, oh, somebody who buys a Big Mac is far more likely than an average customer to buy a fries. This is something we should cross-train employees on. They should ask Big Mac customers if they want to buy fries. Uh, we should, you know, maybe make some kind of combo deal where we offer them together because that's what a lot of people are going to buy anyway. We'll boost our sales that way. All sorts of promotions are possible in cross-training as an operator.
uh, cross training with employees. Okay. But anyway, those are what uh, support, confidence, and lift all mean. Um, okay. Will we have to know like the math? Because I remember when I was looking at the power. You don't have to do any math. There's there's no math. Okay. 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 You should understand what these things are and how they're related, but you won't have to do any math. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Let's see. Uh, cloud attributes, pooled resources. Uh, pooled resources just means the cloud. Okay, I'll just I'll write it. That means the cloud has a large pool of resources. Right, so, so think uh, servers and storage media that it can allocate as needed to its various clients, as various customers. That's what pooled resources mean. Okay, there's no one customer that's going to be using all of them all the time. Uh, backups for cloud, I mean, backups for cloud, that's, there's not much to say about that. Uh, typically, they're going to, I'll, I'll put that here. Just means that data will be backed up regularly and stored as multiple replicas. And... Uh, and also uh, backup applications will be available. Okay, so you guys know if you're starting PowerPoint or Excel or something, it takes a little while for it to get, get running. So the cloud system is probably going to have a few free copies of you know, any of those applications available. If one goes down, if one server goes down, they're going to quickly load your data into those copies and make them available to you. They're gonna switch you over to a new server. Okay, backup applications will also be available on other servers in case of failure. Okay, that's the kind of backups we're talking about there. Okay, strategy development. Uh, Two-phase commit is a whole big thing. Uh, let me come back to that, see if we have time. Uh, Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. Strategy development, though, I'll give you that one. Basic process of strategy development. Business has to first figure out what's possible. Okay. Primarily based on internal capabilities right? What is your business good at? If you're a car maker, you're probably not going to switch right over into, I don't know, being a grocery store, but you might switch over into motorcycles, right? So first you got your business has to figure out what's possible. What are all the things that might be achievable in the next few years? Then from among the possibilities, right? Assess their probable outcomes and pick the best one, right? So whatever thing you think is going to have the best outcomes, you pick the best one. Then, so that's the uh, that's the organizational strategy. Strategy, okay. Then the functional strategies have to be developed. Okay, so things like what will accounting, finance, marketing, operations, HR do to support. Okay, so all of your different uh, business departments, they're all going to have to gear their strategies to supporting this overall organizational strategy. Finally, 
once all that has been determined, right, it's time to assess whether any new IT is needed to make those changes. For example, marketing needs better customer data in order to meet its sales targets. And perhaps a new customer relationship management system is needed. Okay? Something like that. But at any rate, the key thing is, first of all, the organization has to figure out its strategy. Once the organization has figured out its strategy, the functional strategies have to be developed to support that. And once the functional strategies have been developed, then you go about thinking, well, what kind of additional IT are we going to need in order to achieve these functional strategies? Okay. Okay, so yeah, some of these we have talked, uh, these uh, pros and cons of N-tier architecture, I'm gonna jump ahead to that one. Okay. The big pros and cons, right? The I should add, relative to client server, okay? The pros, it's much more flexible, right? You can have users switch between applications and data much more easily, right? Remember when I drew the uh, client server uh, image I had all the all the clients attached to a single server. If they wanted to do some application or access some data that wasn't available on that server, they'd have to go to a different one. So much more flexible. Users can switch between applications and data. Uh, another can expand the tiers separately, right? Which means if you have a lot of data, you can expand the database tier without expanding the application tier. Same for expanding the application tier without expanding the database tier. Okay, that's it. Uh, and just last point, you can manage far larger sets of data and applications than would be possible in client, right? And the reason is, right, in uh, N-tier architecture, you're going to switch between things a lot. It's fairly easy. Client server, uh, when data and applications are too big for one machine, right? So imagine if the biggest uh, hard drive there is, is say, I don't know, eight terabytes now, but your organization has a lot more than eight terabytes of data. Well, you're probably gonna need to shift to something like N-tier because it, your people in your organization are only going to be able to access all the data that can be stored on one machine. So those are the pros. The cons, well, there aren't a lot of cons as such, uh, but just things that are not necessarily better. Uh, so one of the cons, again, relative to client server, it is more expensive to set up and operate, right? It's a more advanced system. So that's something. Okay, so if you're a very small business, and you just have like five people under your roof and ordinary off the shelf PCs are totally fine with maintaining the load, right? You don't need a client, you don't need an N tier architecture for that, right? So client server can be totally fine for small businesses, okay? You just don't need that stuff. Uh, second thing, 
there are some interesting security possibilities. So another thing is uh, individual machines have to be basically maintained in shifts for things like shutdowns, maintenance, right? Uh, installing patches and new software, right? So what often happens in practice in a large organization, you'll have some machines that have had the patches installed, others that haven't. Uh, you know, and that's a bit more, uh, that's something of a management headache, okay? Not generally much of a problem on a small system, but yeah, and again, there are some security uh, possibilities that uh, last, I guess, typically N tier is for large systems with internet access, which, uh, you know, is a source of attacks, right? a source of security attacks, security threats, let's leave it at that. For client server, you typically keep it isolated from the internet these days. But it's not, uh, that's not a, an absolute given thing. But there are a few things. You know, these, these pros are definitely true. This con is definitely true. This one is security is kind of a mixed bag. So I'll, I'll make a note. Security is uh, mixed for client server versus end tier. Each has strengths and weaknesses, and the security depends on how the systems are implemented, right? So I just leave it at that. Security is kind of advanced, but these things. That I got here in green. Whoop. These things you can count on. This one, this one's, you know, this one's kind of debatable. That's fine. Okay. So let's see. I mean, the more you know, the better off you are. I'm not going to tell you you got to know nothing. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Yes, yeah, so you go back through. I've looked at client server architecture. Uh, okay, so advantages of client server architecture, well, there really aren't many, but one thing if you keep it away from the internet, it's probably much more secure. Okay, so that's that's one thing. It's cheaper and easier to set up. Okay, that's another thing. And number three, uh, I would say single point for patches and updates, right? If there's something flawed with the software, you know exactly where to go to fix the thing, and it's going to be pretty straightforward. With N tier architecture, you know, you're going to have to rotate through the machines while they're available to install this stuff. Anyway, we'll do a couple more things. Uh, let's see what we have to talk about. So two-phase commit, we'll cover that later. Yeah, we talked about these things. Uh, business intelligence. Okay, so business intelligence, there's not much to say about that, except it's basically what businesses learn about the world around them. And, you know, they gather data. All of that data helps them learn about the world around them. And that's business intelligence. Specifically, you know, their own capabilities, their competitors' capabilities, the general economic and technological, no logical situation, right? Trends in sales, all that kind of data 
goes into business intelligence, okay? And can be used to make better business decisions, right? Like which new products to pull or keep producing, which employees to fire or retain or promote, right? Uh, which competitors to try to partner with or compete more strongly against or to try to buy out, right? Things like that, all those kinds of business decisions, yeah, they have to know what's going on in the world so they can make good decisions about that. I remember some years ago when uh, Facebook bought Instagram, right? And I believe it was for it was for a billion dollars, and a lot of people said, "Wow, I can't believe they're dropping a billion dollars on that app." But you got to figure Facebook knew what they were doing, right? So, you know, they crunched a lot of numbers, they made the decision, they looked at the fact that they wanted to bring in more new users into Facebook instead of more older customers, and that's what drove the decision. All right. But yeah, business intelligence, we don't have much to say about it except in that generic sort of way. Uh, so I guess that leaves me with one thing, two-phase commit. All right. So Mario, if you're still here, I will talk about two-phase commit for you. And I think that's about everything. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to lift that one straight from the slide because I'm not going to redraw those slides. Uh, let me grab my transaction processing slides here. And again, you could always just hear me talk about it. You go back and watch it in the lecture, too. It already exists there. But I'm going to lift this anyway. Okay. Boom. Okay, so number one, reason for two-phase commit is to ensure all replicas of data Right, of related data are consistent after a transaction, regardless of whether the transaction succeeds or fails, right? Either way, you want all the data to point in the same direction. Let's stretch that. Transaction coordinator, right? This guy, TC, initiates and governs the transaction over multiple database systems. Okay, so that's what the transaction coordinator is. There's some application, some software agent that basically watches what's going on. The resource managers. Again, software agent uh, that manages a set of related databases. For example, replicas of data, right? So if you have some particular thing like the inventory uh, available of a particular item, you might have one resource manager tracking all replicas of that particular bit of data. All right, so what happens then? Stage one, right, part one, a user initiates the transaction, right? Says, let's go, I wanna buy some stuff. Step two, TC, the transaction coordinator, tells the RMs, the resource managers, to pencil in changes. Right, that's basically what it means. So request to prepare basically says, prepare for this transaction that we're gonna try to do. So what the resource managers do, number one, prepare rollback records, right? So in case something goes wrong, they're able to restore the system to its initial state. Number two, tell uh, it's, own databases 
to pencil in, right, to pencil in the changes. And then number three, what else? Report back to TC when done. Okay, when those changes are penciled in, that's what the resource manager is going to do. So one by one, right, each RM reports to the transaction coordinator. Now, at the end, TC has either heard positively from all RMs, in which case it knows, hey, the system's ready to go. I could do this transaction. B, heard negatively from any RMs, in which case the transaction coordinator knows, oh, I can't do this. I'm going to abort the transaction. Everybody, you know, your changes were only penciled in. Just drop those changes. We're not. Or C, not heard from any RMs. Okay. If the transaction coordinator hasn't heard from any of the RMs by the time it's done, then the transaction is going to time out. So in the case of B and C, right, in both of these cases, the transaction will be aborted. It's not going to go through. And the data will all be the same, right? Because those changes are only penciled in in the first place. However, if you hear back positively, then you have the full green light and you're good to go. Okay, so in the case of green, I'll start coloring it in green now. TC tells RMs to make the changes permanent, right? Basically to commit to the changes is what we mean there. Then, again, one by one, the resource managers make changes permanent and tell TC when done. Okay. So, again, one by one, each RM reports to the transaction coordinator. Okay. And we have a similar set of things here in the commit phase which is basically at this point, number nine, TC has either, again, heard positively from all resource managers, in which case it knows, hey, the transaction went through, that's great, okay? Or B, heard negatively from any resource managers, in which case, oh shit, you know, we got to cancel that. So everybody restore your uh, restore your data to its original state using the rollback records. Or C, again, same thing, not heard from any resource managers, in which case, once again, the transaction will time out. So we have the same thing here. This one is good. Put it on a rectangle. This one is good. These two are not. Okay, and I will add step 10. Eventually, rollback records will be discarded, right? Eventually, you're not going to need them anymore. And, you know, how long that's going to take is going to be uh, highly system dependent. But if the transaction goes through and it's all successful, then there's not going to really be a need to maintain those rollback records. Uh, on the other hand, if something fails, the transaction is going to get canceled. You use the rollback records to restore the system. But again, once all that is done, there's not really a need to keep them. So that's two-phase commit. Okay, so I think I covered everything we got here, I think. Any last stuff? So like I said, I'm going to I'm going to post some stuff in the extras folders on lecture about things that students in the past have done to prepare for exams just to give you an idea. I got that. Okay, last call. 3 2 Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's it. We'll see y'all some other time.